Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Um, I know our bulletin says that it is still February, um, but I don't want to point out that, that there's a mistake in the bulletin, but it, and I won't say that it was Stacy's fault, because <laughs> nobody likes to have the whole church know when you made a mistake, and that never happens to me, Stacy. I never make a mistake, and everybody knows it right then. So, uh, like starting five minutes after the like, yeah, hour. like starting late, I looked up and, <laughs> and uh, so, but good morning, we're glad that you're here. Uh, I'm Pastor Don, there's a welcome card in the pews, and if you will uh, fill that out, get your name on there, uh, and drop it, our offering boxes are in the back on each side, and if you will uh, drop that in there, whether you're a regular attender member or just a guest this morning, uh, I like to pray uh, for you by name, so please drop your uh, name in there, and a prayer request if you have one, or just your name, I'll pray for you. Um, but uh, we're going to start our worship, and Brother Phil uh, is, is uh, going gonna to open us with a word of prayer. And so would you stand with, with him as he leads us in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for the sunshine today. Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we come to share in worship, to share in fellowship, and then mostly to worship you. We thank you, God, that you give us a song to sing. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, would infuse this place with your Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Our scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 21. In him, meaning Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the time where we just get still before the Lord. I want to invite you to uh, join me in bowing your head before uh, the Lord and reverencing him. If you have room in your pew, you're certainly welcome to uh, kneel uh, as well as we uh, go to the Lord. Lord, we bend our, our heads and our hearts before you. We bow them before you because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, God, that you who are so high and exalted, who is so worthy of worship, Lord, that you, God, that you deign to come into our presence to make yourself known. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you for your presence here in this place even now. Lord, we ask that you be pleased. We offer you our worship. We offer you our songs of praise, our offerings, our finances. Lord, most of all, we offer you our very lives, ourselves, that you may be glorified. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have poured your love upon us. For it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 2, as we read uh, earlier. And though I did tease a little about uh, Stacy uh, and the date on the bulletin, she does a great job on the bulletin, I think, and uh, we don't tell her that enough. She really does. Last week's was really neat seeing all the little pictures uh, in there, and I thought that was very creative. So um, I do want to give her praise as well as a little ribbing. Um, so I did tell her that we don't expect perfection. If we did, Phil and I couldn't work here. So uh, you don't have to clap for that. Uh, and so, uh, but Stacy, we do appreciate you, and you do a great job. Ephesians uh, chapter uh, two, beginning in um, we're going to go ahead and start in verse nineteen. Chapter 2 and verse 19, there's a, a Bible in the pew in front of you there if you need one. And this is how uh, the scripture reads. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him also you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. 
Father, thank you for your word. Help us to understand it. Uh, help us to apply it. Uh, Lord, speak to our minds and our hearts. Let us leave here um, with your word having done its will in our minds and hearts. Thank you, God, for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are talking about names that God calls Christians. We've talked about names of God before, Jehovah uh, Jireh, the Lord provides, or uh, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord, the God of the army of the host of heaven. Um, last week, we talked about uh, that God calls us children, that he adopts us as his children. Uh, and this week, we're going to look at a word that uh, God calls us uh, here in Ephesians when we were reading, and it says there in verse uh, in verse 21, it says, In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And so we are the temple of the Lord. What? Yeah, we're the temple of the Lord. Now, the Old Testament um, had temples, and that's where the presence of God literally dwelt. Uh, God's, whoa, I don't know what that was there. Uh, God's presence. Did y'all hear something? Feedback or? Okay, I thought it was just me for a minute. Sometimes I worry I'm just, my ears are going and I don't know why I'm looking at Phil. <laughs> in the Old Testament, God's presence lived in the, the tabernacle, the tent of the meeting where Moses would go. Uh, then uh, David. Uh, uh, wanted to build a temple. God did not allow him. Then Solomon's temple was built. Then that temple is destroyed. Then another temple is built. And then uh, eventually, by the time we get to the time of Jesus, uh, there is a, a third temple built. And uh, it, it has been built by King Herod. It's probably uh, as big or maybe even bigger than Solomon's temple. Uh, it was rumored uh, that, it was, that the bricks of the temple that the, the, the mortar used had gold in it, uh, that it was so sacred and holy. So when uh, Titus uh, came in 70 AD and, and destroyed, raised the, the temple and raised Jerusalem because of the rebellion of the, the Maccabean rebellion, uh, literally every stone of the temple was torn down because they were looking for the gold that was rumored to be in it. And so that temple is destroyed. Now, Jesus made a shocking statement to his disciples because he told them, he said, they, they asked him for a sign. He said, I'll tell you what, you tear this temple down and in three days I'll, it'll, I'll raise it up again. And they were like, well, that's crazy. He can't do that. Now, was Jesus talking about a physical building of bricks and sticks and mortar and gold? No, he was talking about what? His body, right? So your body is a temple. You are a temple of God. If you know Christ as Savior and Lord, then just as the presence of God dwelt in that tabernacle and dwelt in those Old Testament temples, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, now dwells in you. And so we, from time to time, will say, well, this is God's house, right? We have the, I know Brother Charles, uh, Brother Charles, wow, that's a way big flashback for me, huh, Carla? So uh, that was one of our first music ministers from <laughs> like 20-something years ago. Sorry, Brother Phil does the children's uh, time sermon, devotional, uh, say it as fast as you can, time. I don't know what you, you know, we call it children's church for the daycare. Um, but we used to have a meet in here, and we'd tell them this is God's house, and they'd look around. They were trying to find where he was because this is his house, and you're supposed to live in a house, right? Because kids are literal. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is a good illustration. Y'all are like, what's he talking about? God, God doesn't live here. So here's the thing. They were looking for God, but God doesn't live in, now in houses made by human hands anymore, does he? He lives in the hearts of his people. And so God lives in his church, his body, the body of believers. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 says it this way, we are, God's, we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, Paul's quoting that, and he's quoting that there's a fulfillment in the New Testament that we now are God's temple, that we as believers, that when we come together, God is here in a special way. Do you believe that? The presence of God is here in a special way among us as believers. The, the psalmist says that God inhabits the praise of his people. So when we sing together, when we fellowship together, when we worship together, that God is here in a special 
way, a, a way that wouldn't be the same if, if we were apart. Um, think of it this way. If, if God is in the church, the, the body of believers, that when we all get together, it's as if, it's as if God multiplies his power and, and the, the worship and the things. It's as if uh, together, uh, that, that as, you, as we weave together, that we grow stronger and stronger. Now, you, did you ever learn that little thing as a kid? Here's the church. Here's what? The steeple. Open up the doors and see all the people, right? So let me, let me make a, an observation. Here's the, here's the church building, and here's the steeple, but you open up the door, and there's all the people with God in them because God lives in each one. In the Old Testament, think of it this way. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. They would go there and worship. In the Old Testament, they had a temple. They would go and they would say, God is holy. And they would go and they would worship and make sacrifices. And they would go and pray. And they would be there. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. In the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. In other words, God puts his spirit in everyone who is a believer. Now, think about that just for a moment that we as a church together had the presence of God. But, but God doesn't just live in the church, all of us together when we get here. He lives in each of us individually, right? He lives in his church, but he also lives in individual Christians. So if you've trusted Christ as Savior, if you've made a, a confession, if you've called upon him to save you and surrendered your life or, or made that commitment to him, if you, what I call having an I do moment with Jesus... If you've done that, and the reason I say I do is no one's just always been married, right? Phil, how long have y'all been married? Sorry, Rhonda, how long have y'all been married? I don't want to get Phil in trouble. 47. 47 years. So at some point, 47 years ago, y'all stood up in front of a preacher and family and friends and you said, I do, right? <laughs> Did y'all really? Okay, y'all did say I do, right? So you made that commitment, and the preacher probably said something before God and these witnesses, right? Because God's presence was there. But you had that I do moment. So to be a believer, there has to be a, a commitment. You don't just, just say, well, you know, I've just always been a Christian. No, there has to be a, a moment. You say, you know what, Lord? I want you to be my Savior, my God. You make that commitment to him. So each Christian is, is someone that, that has a relationship with the Lord. And if you have a relationship with the Lord, you're his temple. What? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, we're in Ephesians. You can stay there, but first, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to you, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Now, hear that. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Hmm. God purchased you, the Holy Spirit. If you made a commitment to the Lord Jesus, then God lives in you, and no longer are you your own. See, here's the thing. For a believer especially, God created you and made you to have a relationship, and once he has that relationship... Your life is no longer your own. Your flesh and blood is no longer your flesh and blood. It belongs to the Lord. The Bible says we can either be slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. Now, I know slavery is not a popular thing uh, these days, but can I tell you something? The Scripture says we are either slaved by our passions, our lusts, that, that, that even though we think we can kind of control it, it eventually will control us. Or we can give ourselves up and surrender to the Lord Jesus and become his slave his servant, ultimately his child, and his temple, and overcome the sin and lust and power. You see, Christ, when he lives in you, all the power of God is available to you. He lives inside of you. That means his love, his purpose, everything about you, all your identity is based on Christ living in you if you're a believer. When, when we become his church, when we become his temple, everything about you now reflects a relationship with him and his power, his love. He, he is so powerful, he even changes your want to. 
What? I mean this. He is so powerful that he even changes your want to. Sin isn't as fun as it used to be. I'm not saying sin is never fun or we'd never do it. But sin isn't fun like it used to be. In other words, I can maybe step in sin, and, and, but then I'm sorry I did. I can't walk in sin anymore. Why? Because my want to has changed. See, once the Holy Spirit lives in you, your want to changes. What do I mean by that? I mean, I can't take a, a beer now and drink it up and say, mm, I love this beer, go, 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 because I can say, well, Holy Spirit, here it comes. I know you want this. No. The Holy Spirit doesn't want that. He's told me not to partake of that. So I can either sin, my personal sin, and grieve the spirit that lives in me, or I can be obedient to him and see God has changed the want to. Let me make it even more personal for some of you. I'm not eating as much bluebell as I used to. Yeah. Because the doctor told me, well, you're kind of borderline diabetic. And I went, what? And your numbers are supposed to, you know, your whatever, AC, AC something. What is it? I should probably learn this stuff, huh? And my numbers are in this range. I'm, I'm in the pre-diabetic whatever state. You know, I'm not, but I could be. And so, so they told me to, you know, exercise and lose weight. And, and, you know, all the things doctors always tell you. Don't you hate them? And, uh, and so I'm not eating. And, and it... And part of the reason I'm not is not because I don't love Bluebell anymore. It's because I love the Lord more. And he kind of told me, he said, look, if you're not going to be healthy, I can't use you like I want to use you. And I'm abusing his body. Now, I know I went from preaching to meddling, didn't I? But I'm just saying that the body is a temple. It's not mine anymore. It's the Lord's. Now, does it mean I can't ever have Bluebell? No, God is gracious and merciful, right? And he forgives any sin. But I don't walk, I don't have a big bowl every night before bed. Carla can attest. And so there's much wailing and gnashing of teeth in the Myers household. But why? Because my body is not my own. The Holy Spirit lives in me. He's a temple. He, the Holy Spirit lives in me, so I've become his temple. He, I'm his. And what is a temple? A temple is a place that is special and sanctified and set apart. You don't do things in church that people should come in here and act differently just in a, in a worship setting than they should at home or, or uh, out, at the, uh, at the, uh, out mowing their yard or out uh, at a ball game or wherever you may be, right? There's something special about being in the presence of God in sanctified spaces. I can remember I grew up in church. You didn't chew gum in church. If you did, you went to hell. Started dating Carla and sat with all these Baptists on the roof, and they, they took out a pack of gum and they passed it all the way down the row. I'm at the end and I'm watching it come. And I'm just thinking, oh my gosh. Carla takes out a piece of gum, and because Carla doesn't eat a lot of gum, she just tears it in half. I think she's less of a sinner than they are. <laughs> and then she does just as Eve did to Adam. She went, <laughs> You want some? And my eyes got big, and I went, no. And I thought, I should get off this pew. Lightning could hit any minute. <laughs> you didn't chew gum in the mind. When we were at church, you weren't chewing gum. God doesn't want you looking like a cow eating its cud. What are you doing? A bunch of sinners? My gosh. Why? Well, it was a sacred place. Now, let me tell you something. A building should be way less sacred than the temple of the Lord that the Holy Spirit lives in. Amen? God doesn't live in this building. He lives in you. If you know him as Savior, he lives inside of you. And he doesn't care if you chew gum or eat bluebell. What he cares is that you're obedient to him and that you lean on him and that you walk with him. Because Ephesians goes on to say uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, look back there. Verse 20, now to him is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Isn't that neat? To him is able to do all, immeasurably more all that we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work where? Within us. The Holy Spirit lives in you. See, God's temple is marked by certain things. And let me just give you two. 
the first thing is God's temple ought to be marked by it being a place of prayer. If the, if the Lord lives in you, you ought to have a relationship with him. Jesus goes into the temple in Matthew 21, and he sees all the money changers. He turns over the tables. He gets all upset, and he says to them, It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. My house should be called a house of what? Yeah. What is prayer? It's communication with God. It's speaking to the Lord and worshiping the Lord and singing to the Lord and listening to the Lord speak back through his word in the quiet time of your mind as he speaks to you and illuminates the scripture. My house should be called a house of prayer. What is your prayer life like? When's the last time you just kind of sang and worshiped God? Are you doing that on a daily? Do you have a daily time where you just meet with God? When the early missionaries got to Africa, they, they, they couldn't build churches, they couldn't do anything. Africa was, was, uh, was a place where missionaries literally went to die. From the West, they didn't have the immunities to the diseases. And those things. So when families would send their family to be missionaries, they, they would say their goodbyes, not just because goodbye, we'll see you when you come back. It was goodbye, we'll never see you again. At the turn of the century, I mean, the, the, eight, the 19th century, they called it the missionary graveyard, Africa. So when those missionaries were there, they would, they would go out and they would share the gospel, and they would teach the people. Now, they didn't build churches because they didn't have time. They knew they'd die any time. What they taught them to do was spend time with God every day in prayer. So in parts of the country where, the, where the, uh, the bush was, people would walk out and find a spot by themselves to pray quietly so they could be alone with God. And they would go to the same spot every time. Pretty soon they had a little trail there beat down. All these Christians going out, finding spots, and, and trails beat down. And, and there was just a, a path, a little dirt path, where people would go to pray, and you could find the inn, and this is where they pray. It's like, oh. Now, if any Christian started neglecting their prayer life, people knew. And someone would gently encourage them, and they would say something like, well, brother, the grass grows thick on your prayer, prayer path. How are you Spiritually. Oh, that if we had prayer paths today and you could see when your preacher doesn't spend enough time in prayer how embarrassed I would be or if I could see where you haven't walked and spent that much time with the Lord how embarrassed we would be. How much time do you spend? Have you made it a commitment to say, God, I'm going to spend some time with you this amount of time every day and I'm going to pray and I'm going to worship, I'm going to read your word, I'm going to listen for you to speak through it. The early Christian churches were people, not buildings. You're the church. You're the temple of God. Are you, is your life marked by prayer? And here's the other great thing that a, 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 a temple of God should be marked by. Prayer, fellowship with God, worship, but also a place of, of help. The, the, the early church, Romans uh, eight twenty six says this, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray or how to pray as we ought. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Do you know what that says? That if you say, well, gosh, preacher, I don't even know how to pray. That's okay. God will help you. You, you read the scriptures. You, you claim the promises. You, you pray the scriptures back to him. You let the Holy Spirit intercede. You ever been so overwhelmed you don't even know how to pray? Every one of us has been there. The Bible says that because the Spirit lives in us, he intercedes for us. He says he searches the thoughts in our, the, our, our minds, but he also knows the mind and the heart of God. So he knows how to pray and how to speak. Isn't that great? The, the Bible says that Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of the Father ever to make intercession for you and I, for me. Isn't that great? What that means is the Holy Spirit right now is praying, and Jesus is praying to the Father, asking him to bless you. Two out of three of the Godhead seeking the Father's will in your life. Isn't that great? See, when you're a temple of God, you're not on your own. You're not alone. Sometimes we need a little help. And it's good to know that the Lord has not left us as orphans, but he's there. I, we've got a video, I, I think, to show. Do we have a video we can show, Nelson? Will that work? Okay. 
If we can, let me, let me watch this video with me for a minute, if you would. It was 2003, Coach Cheeks and uh, Natalie uh, got up there to sing, and she got a little, uh, I think, stage fright kind of hit her. She's in that big stadium. And so he, he uh, I think he's coached the Trailblazers, he, he walked over and, and grabbed a hold. They were playing the Mavericks, by the way. Uh, but he grabbed, grabbed a hold of her. Did you see how he started singing with her? And, and she still was stumbling, right? And he was helping her. And, you know, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is our helper, and I thought, what a great picture of what God does. We know what we should be doing, and somehow she just couldn't get it done. And yet, there came that coach, and he put his arm around her, and he sang with her. She didn't know him from Adam. She'd never seen him before. But he started, and he was feeding her the lines. Did you hear? And then she, she started, and then sing. And then, did you hear the crowd, though? At first, they were like, oh. And then, then they kind of cheered. Then did you hear the... They all started singing with her. So, so that coach changed it from her just being a deer in the headlights and, and falling flat on her face to singing with her. And then he kind of does like this. And then everybody just starts singing. And then the cheering and the crowd. And she went from being all alone by herself, a failure, to having someone come alongside of her and everybody singing with her. And it's a memorial. It's a great thing that we remember and we can look at and we can say, what a great picture of how everyone came together to help that girl. Friends, when the Holy Spirit lives in you, he's a helper. He comes alongside of you and he helps you in your weakness and he helps you overcome what you yourself could not overcome. And not only that, there are other believers out there that will stand and sing with you when you feel like you're the only one who stands for what God believes and the truth of God. You are not alone. You are a temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and God is building us together to become a, a glorious temple for the Lord, and someday he'll come back and receive us, his people, but until that day, he's left the spirit. The Bible says he's left his spirit in us. First Corinthians says that. Ephesians chapter 1 says it. He's left his spirit in our hearts. Isn't that great? You're going to go out, and it's going to get tough to sing praises to the Lord this week. Because I tell you what, the world's going to intervene. Things are going to happen. Trains are going to blow up. Somebody's going to use the wrong pronoun. I don't know. You just keep singing for the Lord. And you realize, 
Holy Spirit, I need your help. He is there. And Lord, I need your help. And there are other believers. Lord, raise up other believers to help because we are the temple of the Lord and we are going to stand and we're going to give glory for him and praise him till he returns. Amen? Amen? That's who you are. You're a child of God, but you're also a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Wow. You're ready for this week. You're, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You're his temple. He goes with you wherever you go. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on. That's good preaching. Amen? Amen? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you live in us. I thank you, Lord, that you have, you have plans for us to become something great and beautiful like a temple. But I thank you that you have not left us as orphans, that, Lord, you are inside our hearts. And that, Lord, when we stumble, just like Coach Cheeks there, Lord, you come alongside and you put your arm around us. And you help us, Lord. You help us give you the glory and sing to you. Achieve what you have called us to do. To share our faith. To love someone who's not easy to love. Lord, you, you give us the strength and the power. Because you're almighty God. And you live in us. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you that, that we're your temple. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence and your peace that is available to us as believers. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a hymn of commitment. If you don't know Christ as Savior, if you've never had that I do moment I spoke about, this time is for you. Maybe you're just carrying a burden and you'd like someone to pray with you. You'd like someone to come alongside you. I, I'd be happy to, to pray with you, whatever your, your need is. Um, but you come, you come as, as we sing. Amen. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. And uh, we have uh, Wayne and Ruth Vaughn are coming uh, uh, to, if you will come up here. And uh, Wayne and Ruth are uh, coming uh, from a sister Baptist church, uh, at First Baptist. And Wayne... Uh, uh, was pastor there. He is now helping his brother uh, take care of his brother in, in poor health uh, here in uh, Terrell. Terrell. Well, Terrell, yeah. Isn't it really? Uh, Able Springs. Yeah, Able Springs. So, but uh, not to get too specific, but uh, uh, they have been members here a long time ago before God called them to preach and to the ministry. So we're glad to have them back again. Now, Wayne uh, and Ruth, we have a, a deacon and his family that. Uh, who will that be? Okay, Deb and Branna, and they're uh, assigned to pray for y'all for the next 60 days. We know this is spiritual, and you know this, that, that yeah. you're following the Lord, so Satan's going to try to somehow throw a roadblock in that. So they're, they're just kind of your personal prayer warriors to ask the Lord to pr protect you and hedge you about. And so, of course, you know Deb and Branna. So. And so, uh, if you're excited about that, would you say amen? I'm excited. And we'll let you come by and shake their hand. You can clap. I tell you what, it takes a lot of courage to look at you people. It's scary up here. <laughs> so uh, you can come by and shake their hand, hug their neck, tell them how proud you are that they want to be part of our fellowship, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll be dismissed in prayer. I'm going to ask... A couple quick words. Oh, I'm going to ask... Next, yep. week, next Sunday is time change Sunday. Make sure that you have your clocks set back. And gentlemen, we... Forward. Oh, set forward, yes. Spring forward. Spring forward. We lose that hour. <laughs> But uh, remember that, and, and men, this is the greatest time to have prayer breakfast ever. You lose that hour every yeah. night. We're going to be here early. That's to right. Prayer breakfast next time. So. We'll, we'll see if their prayer trail looks beat down to men's breakfast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, but we're going to be. Why don't you stand with us? Thank you for those announcements. I forgot that, brother Phil. But it is time change, so don't uh, don't forget. Please spring forward. Spring forward. And, uh, and we'll see you here next Sunday. Uh, Doug, will you close us in prayer, please? Good Lord, we do pray for you. We thank you for all you do. We are so blessed, Lord, to come worship you like we do. Please guide us, Lord, to glorify your name, to meet our divine appointments this week, to witness to us. Amen.